Good morning and welcome to the next talk on the workshop on uh, programming research in mainstream languages. Now we will talk about hidden mainstream that, um, languages that are used on the mainframe. My name is Vadim Zaitsev, I'm also known as Grammarware. I have worked in uh, research in several institutions, mostly focusing on software evolution, software languages and quite often publishing about grammars in a broad sense. I have also worked several years in the industry in companies like Raincode and Raincode Labs where we were mostly busy with legacy systems. In particular, uh, we were uh, looking at very, very big code bases and migrating them either to a different platform, to a different language, and so forth. So, since uh, a couple of uh, days ago, I am an associate professor at the University of uh, Twente, and before that, I was an, uh, the chief science officer of this Raincode and Raincode Labs. Uh, so, this is just to, uh, to give you some evidence that I'm not uh, completely inventing all the strange things that I will be telling you, that I have uh, seen them with my own eyes. Uh, in general, I'm Googleable under the name of Grammarware. This wonderful uh, picture I have taken at the Deutsches Museum in Munich last year, and this is uh, the, one of the most famous mainframe computers. So, this is IBM System 360. So, let's talk about the languages that we used on this uh, mainframe and let's choose and pick because there are too many of those and I only have half an hour for you. So, COBOL. COBOL is the obvious choice, everybody has heard of it and it's a language that was designed by a committee but the advisor for it was uh, the famous Grace Murray Hopper, inventor of you know, compilation, oh, automated compilation by a uh, via computer, and the designer of some other languages. It is extremely verbose. It looks like English, and it is surprisingly readable. Even if you take very very old COBOL code uh, now, you can just read it without any preparation, unlike uh, Perl or uh, even Java or Haskell. Uh, it's very hard to find any empirical fodder for it. Well, very little COBOL is, is open source. And closed source portfolios are huge. And not only because of the verbosity of the language, because verbosity usually stands within one uh, statement, and I'm talking about the number of statements. And also COBOL is extremely hard to implement. It has a very large grammar. Yes, it's readable, but it's readable by a human. It also has a lot of uh, sub-clauses in each and every single one of its uh, statements. It has a lot of statements, it has complex semantics to, uh, to implement it, so there are not that many uh, COBOL compilers around. Not all languages are created equal, right? Speaking of which, let's, let's talk about uh, language generations. So, the, uh, what people usually call the first generation language, that's just machine code. So, Right now, pretty much nobody programs in uh, machine code. The second generation language is uh, assembler. So it's the same, but you're al allowed to give names to, to things. And if you give names to things, that they become easier to learn. They become easier for humans to think about and to implement and to, to manipulate in, in any way. That uh, led to um, several third generation languages, like COBOL. Or uh, in the same boat, there's actually I don't know, Java and Haskell and whatnot. It's a it's a sort of a normal language that anybody can use. And if you're looking at uh, in this case, for instance, a move statement, then it's a move. It's an assignment, right? It's it, nothing magical is going on. It's pretty much the compiler uh, understands what's going on here and generates assembler code or machine code uh, to or virtual machine code to, uh, to execute it. And then there were fourth generation languages, which were uh, sort of an even higher level according to, uh, to what people understood back then by, uh, by level of a language. If you go to Wikipedia and ask about 4, uh, 4GL, it says that the very first one was this Mark IV. And uh, the, uh, the evidence for its greatness and wonderfulness is usually given in the form of anecdotes like, oh, you know, uh, suddenly a vice president of our company comes in and we've just finished installing this Mark IV and he asks uh, a weird question, but the system engineer doesn't fret and immediately punches it into a punch card, obviously, because how else would you enter data into a computer, and gives the punch card to the computer and it immediately starts the computation 10 minutes late. You see, the focus is on the speed of development and on the amount of, uh, of code produced. In the 70s, there were many, many more uh, 4G, uh, 4GLs uh, proposed. In the 80s, some people were so convinced 
that uh, 4GLs are the future, then they started writing books saying that, oh no, application development doesn't need to involve programmers. We can get rid of those uh, strange uh, people who are writing code and asking uh, ask for a lot of money and just generate everything. That would be fine. These books are largely forgotten by, uh, by now and they have not made any dent on the uh, history of software uh, engineering. But right now, in 2020, the very 4GL that Wikipedia says uh, that uh, was the very first one, the Mark IV, it's still alive. It's alive and it's uh, owned by Computer Associates and it's called the Vision Builder. The pack based language from the 70s that was so uh, promoted in the 80s, it's still alive. It's owned by IBM and it's called Visual Age pack base Well, it's not that well maintained and a lot of people are running away from uh, from. Uh, from actually both of them and from all 4GLs uh, because it's uh, extremely hard to find any um, any experts in those languages. Well, let's go back to COBOL. What about it? Right? Is it is it dead? Is it not dead? Is it is it relevant at all? On this slide I've collected a couple of facts coming from usually uh, Reuters and uh, Gartner. These are two uh, very big organizations that are proficient, extremely proficient in extracting data, extracting information from uh, from all over the place, from the, the places where you would usually not have any access uh, uh, to. So, for instance, a couple of years ago, Reuters had uh, a report where it says that 43% of all banking systems are built on COBOL. 43% of all banking systems. So if you care how your uh, uh, if you can't know how your bank uh, operates, it's probably COBOL with a chance of 43%. 50% of new applications were built in COBOL, ne not just banking applications, all applications in the world in general. That comes from 2003 and I don't believe that the, these numbers have aged that well because right now a lot and a lot of applications are written in languages like JavaScript. Right. But uh, back then that was still uh, very high. 75%, that's very hard, of business data is processed by COBOL. That was also in 2003, but that probably didn't change that much because uh, if you build a fancy front-end with JavaScript or PHP or what have you, it still means that somewhere in the back-end something needs to process the data and store it in the database and whatnot. And quite possibly that's still COBOL. A couple of years ago, 80% of all in-person transactions in banks, financial transactions, would end up running some COBOL code. In uh, particular, 95% of ATM swipes rely on COBOL code. A couple of years ago, so that's probably still uh, true or very close to truth. So if you own a bank card and you, if you care about the correctness of its use, then, well, say thank you to COBOL and to all the people who worked on COBOL. How much COBOL is there in existence? Uh, well, uh, in 2003, Gartner estimated it to be around 200 billion lines of code, and a couple of years ago, Reuters reported 220 billion lines of code. That is quite a lot. So the difference between a billion and a million, as you know, is absolutely massive. So, it, uh, I mean, in, in our minds, these are very um, similar words, but uh, it Having this much code basically means that even if we have some newer technology and some better languages that can maybe allow us to write uh, programs a little bit shorter and even all the programmers in the world stop everything that they're doing and just rewrite whatever COBOL is in existence, they will be busy for several years. And then, after they are done, they will need to uh, ensure that the behavior, the new behavior of the system is the same as the behavior of the old one. That could be fun. So, one code base usually contains quite a lot. So, the largest that I have personally seen is 250 million lines of code. That's a very big bank in Spain called Bankia. It's, uh, uh, it's not even the biggest bank of Spain. So, the biggest one might, might have a bigger one. I'm not sure if they're using uh, uh, Cobol. Uh, and that's something that we were migrating with uh, Rancor Labs. It's very Googleable. You can find quite a lot of uh, information about this on the internet, pointing at that particular bank and at uh, Rancor Labs. The largest code base that I have seen reported and talked about was of Bank of New York Mellon. 
which contained 343 million lines of code uh, eight years ago. So by now, the, this bank is still known to hire uh, COBOL programmers. So they uh, still have it, uh, and probably it has grown by now a little bit. Uh, there was a study by Technical Strategy Group which said that the replacement costs are around $25 per line. I will let you do the computation. Uh, one COBOL app costs $5 million a year to continue running, as was reported by CEO of Microfocus uh, also something like 20 years ago. Um, right now, as we know from uh, our experience at Raincode, it heavily depends on the MIPS. So, remember in the beginning I told you that the System 360 had 1 million uh, instructions per second. So now, if you have like a medium-sized bank with a modest uh, uh, code base and a modest number of transactions, they usually run around 4,000 MIPS and per year that would cost them from 6 to 16 million US dollars. And so that's again quite a lot, so they are very happy to migrate to somewhere else, pretty much anywhere where it is uh, cheaper. So this is what, uh, what was expected of uh, COBOL. There were a lot of people who were predicting the death of COBOL in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, they are still predicting it now, and COBOL seems to uh, be doing fine. Uh, there are quite some banks that switch to new versions of COBOL and they are doing you know, ob object orientation and anything fancy that you can imagine being done in any other language, but uh, in COBOL. Uh, and there are some other companies that are unhappy with it, but they continue to use it because they uh, want to uh, profit from it. So, a couple of famous COBOL quotes. There was a quote by Jordan made in 1996 that it's only a matter of time before all existing COBOL programmers die of old age. Uh, so, Ed Jordan has aged significantly in the meantime, but COBOL is still alive and well. And um, in order to cite him properly, I had to reread his Rise and Fall of uh, the American Programmer. Uh, I think was the name of the uh, piece, and it also contains quite a lot of um, controversial statements which, um, let's say, if he would try to publish it now, that would not be published and that would make him unemployable for uh, quite a significant time. Uh, there is another quote by Edsha Dijkstra who said that the use of COBOL cripples the mind and its teaching should be regarded as a criminal offense. But as Ralph Lemmel in his uh, talk uh, titled Stop Bashing COBOL, uh, pointed out that research on COBOL does not cripple the mind and it should not be regarded as a criminal offense, even according to uh, very harsh words of Edsher Dijkstra. So, if you want to do research on COBOL, you're fine. Your mind is fine and your criminal record will be clean as ever. So, the takeaway number one from this is that legacy languages matter and software written in them runs your life. There are second generation languages like uh, IOM Assembler. If you want to know more, uh, Google up this paper. Uh, there are third generation languages like COBOL, PL1 and so forth. And there are fourth generation languages which are quite a lot and they are much smaller and much, uh, much narrow in, in uh, scope. Right, so uh, let's talk really language features. Language features that you should be afraid of. So the first one is indentation. Right? So there are languages that uh, allow for freeform indentation, like C or any C-like language. So this example is of course from the obfuscated C uh, contest. This goes to the extreme, but it shows that it's, it doesn't matter how you format the code, the code runs and compiles fine. In some languages, you align some homogeneous parts, right? So in Haskell, for instance, if you have a do or a clause or a let in or if and else, you need to align that particular part vertically. And for the rest, uh, the compiler doesn't care. In Python, you need to align all blocks. So whenever you have any kind of block, you, you go an indentation in, indentation uh, out. Right? So in legacy languages, you have this as design uh, guideline. Right? So, when, uh, when the language was designed, this is a Fortran uh, statement, this is a, a COBOL statement, but it's this, the uh, idea is the same. One line, so one statement, is one punch card. Which basically means, also, if you run out of space, you run out of space. There is no more space on this punch card. 
in uh, in the case of COBOL, uh, well, the lines are not written uh, here, but I've uh, I've added them for your convenience. So there is a special column to uh, indicate the line continuation. There is, there are several uh, places where you can start writing with different semantics attached to it, and then there are some numbers at the beginning and in the end to indicate uh, where we are in a program and what program is this. Line continuations work differently in different languages, so uh, don't think that it's sort of a problem that's easily solvable once and for all. So, for instance, in, uh, in assembler, you go to the uh, very end of uh, the line, and uh, at uh, column 72, you put a star or uh, some, some other symbol, and then it indicates that the next line will be uh, continued. But in COBOL, you, um, you don't know anything on that line, but on the next line, you put a special token and uh, uh, line continuation column, which is before the, uh, the text. So takeaway number two is that you might think that the problems that I'm talking right now are tiny and they are related to parsing. And parsing is considered to be a solved uh, problem. So indentation in particular is usually solved ad hoc. It's solved per case. So every time you need to write a compiler, you invent some hacks to deal with indentation. And for line continuation, the same. You do case per case and there is no like nice calculus that allows you to express this. There is no parser generator in the world that supports uh, this. Again, as an example of something that uh, you can do and that's publishable at a pretty high-ranked uh, conference, in this case Gypsy, is this paper where uh, I uh, explained why I had to write basically a new parser generator for a very strangely uh, structured uh, language that was very in, uh, based on, well, not even indentation, but uh, position uh, in, in the line. Another language feature that you should be uh, afraid of is naming. For instance, Fortran had implicit typing, so you could write implicit real a to z, implicit integer from i to n. So if you call your variable adjustment, you don't have to declare it. You can declare it with some different type, but if you don't, it starts with an a, so it will be real. And name, if you want it to be character uh, or uh, character sequence, you have to declare it like this. If you uh, don't declare it, it will be an integer, even though it's called name. Yeah. So the first two lines here, the implicits, they are implicit. So they are implicit implicits. It means even if you don't write those, they are still there. And if you want to cancel them, you, can, you have to write implicit none. And that's very, uh, that's very typical for older design of languages where they were mixing the meta level with uh, sort of a normal uh, level, where you can suddenly have a statement that changes the entire way how your program is run or compiled or executed, or in this case, typed. Rex, a third generation language used on mainframes, is a language without declarations and without types. So everything is a string, and if you don't assign anything, then its default value, its own name, capitalized. Let's read this text line by line and don't blink. So, whole dot equals empty. Whole dot is a special variable called stem. So, because it ends with a dot, it basically means that once we have this assignment, everything that starts with whole dot, which will have this as a default value. Whole dot nine is full, so one of them will be full. Whole dot rat is also full. Rat is cheese, and then we drop whole rat. Drop means that anything that led to the current value of whole.rat needs to be disregarded according to whole.rat. So we lose not only the line 3 for whole.rat, but we also lose in the line number 1. Not for all the other holes, but for whole rat, we lose it. So then when we say, say a whole one, whole dot mouse, whole dot nine, whole dot rat, it will print empty, because whole dot one is undefined, but it's a part of a stem, and that stem was uh, assigned empty. Then it will print uh, another empty, because whole dot mouse is uh, also undefined. Whole dot nine is assigned to full at line two, so it will be full. And then whole dot rat was dropped, so the whole dot for whole dot rat only is undefined, so it means that it will be caps lock whole dot, and then rat is defined, so it will come in here and it will be dot cheese. 
And this example they really use in the very documentation of the language. So this is an example that is supposed to explain things to you and is supposed to make things easier to understand. Enjoy. So in App Builder, names are not unique. So if something is called A, it doesn't mean that it's the same A all over the place. In particular, you're going to have a sentence called map A in A to A in A. Because if it's in, then it's obviously that it's a set item and a set. And if it's an off, it's obvious that this is a field and a view. In BL1, you probably know this because this is a famous anecdote. In BL1, keywords are not reserved words. So you can call your variable then, else, or if. And then write something like if then equals else, then else equals if, else if equals then. This is compilable code. Well, if you have a DCL block where you declare these variables to be of, uh, of the right type, then it will run. I've checked it with a raincode PL1 uh, compiler. However, the second level of the joke here is that on the first uh, line, the equal sign means comparison, and on line two and three, it means uh, assignment. Enjoy. Cobol has contractions, so if you write move 42 to x of y, normally it would mean in, let's say, Java notation, y dot x, but it can mean that basically there is an x which we want to assign something to, and somewhere up the tree there is a y. So there may be several steps between y and x, but y needs to be an ancestor of uh, x. It doesn't have to be the root. So the compiler needs to basically go all around the symbol table, try to find out if there is a y that has a, a, a descendant node called, uh, called x. And if there are multiple of them, it must complain and stop the compilation. But if there is only one, then it must work. What's even worse, you can contract conditions in uh, COBOL. And then write something, if x is greater than 0 and equals to y or z then do something. And so in this case it uh, means that if you say just and equals then you're still talking about the left hand side that you've been talking there and you can even skip the comparison operator as well. The next language feature to be afraid of is called lexical import. So imports in Haskell work very straightforwardly because it's a well-designed language. So if you say import data maybe, then it imports everything that's from that module into your own namespace. If you say import qualifying, it imports it but keeps the qualifier. And if you import something, you can also you can do it hiding something and then uh, it will disregard some of the contents of that uh, thing. In Python, it's exact opposite. So when you import without saying anything, you're importing it with a qualifier. If you import it as something, then you import it uh, into your uh, namespace as a particular name. And if you want it really in your namespace without any name, then you say from library import star. And that way you can also say from library import something very specific. And then, uh, so it's, it's then the, the opposite of uh, hiding in, uh, in Haskell. However, in COBOL, this is what you write. This is a real COBOL code running in production somewhere. I'm not saying where. And it's obfuscated, right? So I may or may not have uh, changed some, uh, some names and some positions. Uh, but what happens here is that it goes, it, well, copy is, uh, is the import in uh, COBOL. So when you say copy something, it looks up for that file. And if you don't say replacing, it just takes that file and imports it. Uh, but if you say replacing, it takes that file, the textual content of that file, and it, it does a flat textual level replacement. So in this particular case, they thought that this is, uh, uh, this is safe, but just imagine the first uh, copy running twice, and then everything will, uh, will break. So the last language feature that you should be afraid of is, of course, transfer of control, because there are different ones. So you think that goto is considered harmful. If you think so, well, try alter. So in uh, let's suppose that we have this uh, piece of COBOL code, which, well, proce procedure division basically means from now on there will be code. Data is uh, somewhere above that. And we have several paragraphs here. Exit on error, exit update record, and exit rollback record. 
Paragraphs are basically like methods or uh, you know, routines. An exit on error contains only one go-to statement, which says go to exit update record. In COBOL, you can also say alter exit on error to exit role record, which basically means that alter exit on error, so we will go to the uh, paragraph called exit on error, we will expect to find a go to statement right in there, and we will change the target of that go to into something else at runtime. You can do it multiple times, and if you have different uh, priority uh, levels of uh, programs, then it might even co come back to its original state. If you want more, then uh, yeah, go to plus enter is, is a good thing. Also, read uh, about uh, different kinds of computed go tos in Fortran, it's very interesting, very educational. And then, then there is an execute uh, thing in, uh, in an assembler of IBM which really promotes writing self-modifying code, which is, of course, very nice of them. And structured uh, transfer of uh, control, we have next sentence in COBOL, which transfers control to the end of the sentence. And sentence is a bunch of one or more statements. So in COBOL, there is something between a statement and, uh, and a paragraph which pretty much never exists in any other languages. In COBOL you can have perform through, where what you execute might depend on uh, the physical position of the line and of the paragraph inside your uh, file. PL1 has introduced a huge do loop that uh, could do pretty much anything within one, uh, one big loop, so until, uh, while, anything. And AppBuilder took it even further, so in AppBuilder, while and until and uh, Varine and an index and whatnot, all these clauses, they become an actual statement which is only valid inside the do block. So you can uh, have your while statement, for instance, not in the beginning, not at the end, but somewhere in the middle of your, uh, of your loop. How cool is that? And if you want something even more cool, then look at uh, exception handling in Rex, which is called signal. Takeaway number three is that, contrary to uh, commonplace uh, expectation, documentation is quite usually is available and sometimes even free. When you're reading it, read it very, very carefully. Do not blink, do not fall asleep, do not skip a single line because things, that, well, terms that you might recognize will mean something else. And uh, things that you think are familiar will work very differently. So always expect the unexpected and you will still be surprised. And for research, this is all good. This is all, it's full of challenges. It's full of very strange, bizarre things that have not been solved before that there is an industrial need to solve. And if you want to know more, try to read this uh, paper where I tried to really make a nice narrative explaining why, for instance, 4GLs are not good as DSLs and what challenges do you come across when you are really writing and developing a, a compiler for, uh, for a legacy language. So the mega conclusion of all this is that your life is run by COBOL and uh, to some lesser extent by other mainframe languages. If you do some baking, if you do some booking, some ordering, then this is all COBOL or well not all but somewhere between half of it and all of it is COBOL. In order to uh, bring the researchers back to their comfort zone, I have uh, developed a language called Baby Cobble. Uh, the website is still in uh, work in progress, but you can, uh, uh, you can visit it now or later. Uh, and it's basically a very tiny language which has very uh, small number of statements, and each of these statements is extremely simple, and still it represents one particular problem that uh, is taken and condensed into its minimal form from some language like COBOL or REX or PL1. And in general, mainframe languages are great for researchers because they hide many challenges and that's a good thing. You can, you can solve these challenges in a fundamental way. You actually, as researchers, you have the capabilities, you have the time, you have the resources and you have all the fancy frameworks to actually do that. So please go there, explore and have fun. 
I'm Grammarware. Uh, Google me up and follow me on uh, all the places where you find me. Thank you for your attention. And now, if you're watching during the workshop, I will be very happy to answer your questions.